staying safe, staying at home, keep yourself, keeping yourself and your family miles away from coronavirus if that's possible. It's very devastating. Assalamu alaikum everybody. Good morning. I'm still a little bit sleepy, so I'm a bit slow. Yes, it's a very strange time for all of us, um, but it looks like it's a quiet Sunday morning. So I hope we hope you join us. Um, as many of you as you can please share it with anyone who might be benefiting from these conversations that we are talking about marriage and we have questions and discussions and debates and dilemmas and one of the biggest dilemmas that we are bringing you today to think about is should I stay or should I go why do people want to leave marriages how do you know you need to leave how do you know it's time to leave or how do you know there is still enough life in your marriage that will help you to save and salvage the relationship. So please do join us uh, with questions, with reflections. Are going, we can see your comments, send us um, you know, reflections and share good practice and dilemmas uh, with us, with the um, audience that we have. So Alhamdulillah, we have been doing this for a number of weeks now. It seems like you guys are enjoying what we are doing. So we have fun usually when we have these conversations. So um, today um, and every other week when we have been doing these conversations, we are following going through a book and we are discussing certain aspects of the book. And this is a book written by um, Ajman Masur, my husband, um, 10 Steps to Getting and Staying Married from an Islamic Perspective. A quite a substantial big book um, for anyone who is embarking on the journey of marriage or anyone who is not quite sure whether the marriage is still working. They have lost the spark. They have you know, have questions and dilemmas. So this book is for everyone before, during and even after marriage. So do join us for the conversation. Today we are talking about why do people leave and how do we know whether we, we, we have to stay in the relationship? Obviously, people think about leaving when relationship has gone south and when relationship are causing trouble, when people are upset, when people don't know how to solve their problems, when pe relationships have run aground. Um, and so many other problems. But we will, inshallah, be highlighting in details as much as we can some of the reasons why people leave the relationship. In our, in my book, page 175, just in case people have the book and they want to refer to it. I'm just wondering if people are usually saying hello to us by this time. So whether are we connected and we have... I think we may have been connected. Let's have uh, a look. Hmm. Oh, hold on a second. Just to see if, if, um, if come you're on. around, just send us a thumbs up. There so you are. Lots of people have said already. Great. Assalamu Good alaykum morning. Assalamu alaykum. <laughs> Alison so um, sure. um, El Tawil has said, Assalamu alaykum. Sarah Huda Gordon says, Assalamu alaykum. Wa alaykum Jana Hal says, Assalamu alaykum. Salam Jana. Um, I was expecting you this morning, as usually. And then Fatima Khanum says, MashaAllah, excellent session. MashaAllah, may Allah reward you. Shama Rahman is awake and says, uh, Salam to both of you. Wa alaykum salam. Um, so, um, Ajma, before we go into this, have you ever thought about leaving? No. You have never thought about leaving? No. Ever? Ever. Not this marriage. Hmm. I've never thought of it. I, I think it's a very interesting question because... Are you, have you got a confession to make? Well, no, but, but I do know is I think anyone I have ever spoken to about the relationship, at some point you will get to very, very close to the idea of leaving or you're actually thinking of leaving. Um, the relationship and and I, I don't think we should lie about this. I think we should be honest about this is that <laughs> no. I'm gonna get my orange juice which you have kindly brought for me. I'm gonna <laughs> pick it up from behind me Oh my I was Spanish orange juice. Getting <laughs> my throat uh, <laughs> Lubricated this is made at, at home by the way freshly squeezed. I squeezed it yesterday from a fantastic bunch of um, Spanish oranges that we buy from our local Turkish grocery. Okay, you're dodging the question. So no, no, I'm not <laughs> dodging the question I'm just um, uh, Getting people's appetite up anyway carry on Hannah. Bismillah so I don't think we should lie about this. I, I think every marriage comes to a point and every person comes to a point where they seriously start asking the question whether I made the right choice. Do I have enough stamina to stay? Do I want to stay? And I think the more honest we are about this, the, the better solutions and the way forward we can find. Um, um, okay, well, you've, been, you've answered the question. Have you thought of leaving? That's the yes. Question. Okay, I have never d done that. Uh, the reason I've never th done that is because when I um, look at a human being, when I look at a person to get married to, I fundamentally weigh up a few things. Mm. Is this human, human person, I can live with, mm. despite her weaknesses, flaws, mismatched ex expectations, etc., etc. And if I know fundamentally that this person has got substantial 
character traits with which I can live, I would never, I would, I would never uh, think of leaving them. Why would I? Oh. So, I have never thought of leaving them. No. So you may have, and you can give your reasons, mm. but I have never thought of it. I realized that the reason why I thought about leaving is that I don't think it's to do with the relationship. It wasn't to do with the relationship. It was to do with me. Okay. And I think it's it's something that it took me a long time to realize and accept that my reason for leaving would have been an egoistic reason, which is why I'm really glad I didn't. Um, and uh, just as a kind of preparation for you, for our conversation, if you are thinking of leaving, and I know some of you who are already thinking about it because you've, re you've reached out to us and you asked whether we should stay or not. If you are thinking about leaving, the first question you might want to ask yourself is, is this because of you that you want to leave? You have your own very specific reason or is it to do with the relationship? Because I think what I discovered and what I, I learned about this process, and it's this incredibly painful process actually, and, and my husband has been a witness to it, is that the reasons why, if you want to leave, it could be very egoistic. You are not getting what you want. It's all about me. It's all about, you know, an emotional need that needs to be fulfilled. And sometimes people leave very early, very quickly, and they don't really think about whether they could have held out a little bit longer. Of course, we will talk about other issues like violence and abuse, and that's a very different discussion. But just as where you are, have you, have you come to that point that you see no reason that this relationship can be actually turned into a better relationship instead of you being selfish? I think the most important question we need to ask ourselves is, and I've already asked that to myself over and over again, can I live with this human being for the rest of my life because that human being would be able to help me and I'll be able to help her realize our collective as well as individual dreams. Ultimately, while marriage could be could appear as romantic, as all about love and all about emotions, actually I look at marriage as a more of a practical relationship between two human beings. We're not born to live alone, by the way. So since I can't live alone, I need to live with somebody. That's my equation. And if I need to live with somebody, I need to find somebody who I can live with. Someone who can live with you too. Yeah, but I. But it's a question to me. Hmm. I need to live with them. And I can't even die alone. Somebody would have to bury me. That's why we have family. That's why we have children. That's why we have friends, we have relatives. Collectively, as a society, we do things for one another. So while I'm alive, I need to make sure I have somebody substantial with whom I can live with. Um, I've lived with my family at the earlier stage of my life, but then I have to live with somebody else. So that's how I look at it. I'm not overly obsessed with how romantic my relationship must be and how um, emotional it must be. I am actually not too fussed about it. If it is, alhamdulillah. If it isn't, as long as functionally I am civil, my wife is civil, she is merciful and kind to me, I'm merciful and kind to her, we are aware of each other's weaknesses and, as in strengths and we can create that partnership as we've done so far in our uh, book, in my book. Uh, as long as you can create that partnership, it works. Let's go straight into the conversation. Okay. So the first thing, it, uh, you, you can talk about that, why women usually leave a marriage. <laughs> oh, women leave their marriage because their husbands are too busy working, playing sports, watching TV, surfing the net or simply hanging out with friends. Most of these women don't want to leave their long-term relationship, but they do. They cry over it, they mull over it again, and they agonize over it. It's never an easy decision, but they make the devastating decision and leave. So this point is really talking about being um, emotionally unavailable. And I think what it is, is we need to look at it again. If you see these signs in your relationship that your husband is picking everything else except you, making sport a priority, making his friends a priority, making anything and everyone else a priority about you, then you are emotionally at some point going to be devastatingly alone and uh -huh. you will not be fulfilled. So you will start thinking, what's the point of me being around just to make the food, just to keep the house clean and look after the children? That's a reason why you feel emotionally um, unloved and uncared for. Asma Prais uh, Paisley says, Nobody surely goes into a marriage without wanting to work. Mm. And if yours is a wonderful marriage, um, first, alhamdulillah, second, you're very fortunate. Well, look, my dear sister Asma, nobody is fortunate or not fortunate. You have to put your work into a marriage. What you invest in your marriage is what you get out of it. It's like a bank account. If in your bank account you don't put money in it, 
don't deposit on time adequate amounts of money, on a savings account especially, and your current account or any other account from where your money, everyday expenses have been paid off and you are in a big time trouble like right now, for example, with COVID-19, no job and no support and help, and you go to draw money from your savings account, you've not made any investment in it. You will not be able to draw anything. Marriage requires investment. So one of the reasons why women leave is because they find their husband too busy doing everything else. And I have a client right now who mm. is exactly that. He's saying to me, well, I've not been around. I don't give my wife any time. I'm too busy. I've got too many things going on in my life. I've got a career. I've got to earn money. He's doing it with the right intention, by the way. The intention is right. His intention is to provide for his family. Of his course. intention is to be making enough money to be able to pay for a house as soon as possible, to be mortgage free so that he doesn't have to chase money. He says, I'm only young once. I want to devote my time in getting the money to be able to pay for my home. I understand that. But in that process, he has lost work-life balance. If you earn millions of pounds and your wife and your children just leave you, if you earn millions of pounds and your wife and your children have been upset all the way and resent you, what's the point of your millions of pounds? Yeah. There is no point in it. So mm -hmm. absolutely right, brothers and sisters. One of the reasons why many women think of leaving their relationship is because it's an emotionally empty relationship. Husband is not present. He is not available. He's too busy working, chasing the world or just being selfish, playing games on the on. I have got a client who comes home every day and spends three, four hours playing games on the computer after work every day. Question is, what is he avoiding? He is, of course, avoiding something that in itself a discussion. But why is he doing that in the first place? What's his problem? I have to ask him, what's your problem? Why are you sitting at home? Even if you're on your own, even if you're single, why would you spend three, four hours yeah. every day playing games on a, on a, on a screen? You're, you're wasting your brain and your life and your breath away. Simple equation. Anyway. But also, let's not forget about women. Just one point I want to make is that being a woman by nature, we, and I know at this our age, when I think about this, that the kids are growing up, we come to a point where we realize that we have been caring and looking after children, looking after homes and families, and we actually need emotional support, probably more towards the middle and the end of the relationship than at the beginning, because we are running dry, we are tired, and we need emotionally being supported. And men tend to leave their marriage because their wives are too busy criticizing them for everything. Um, it seems man can never do anything right in the eyes of their wives. Their wives complain and nag over the smallest to the biggest issue in the home or the outside. The husband looks around or husbands look around for appreciation for anyone. Any woman who pays them a compliment or provides them attention, they tend to fall for them. They long for that appreciation from their wives, but when that is not forthcoming, they agonize over what to do. They think long and hard, and despite the consequences, they leave. I'm sorry to say this, sisters. It is true from uh, perspectives that I have seen, even experienced, as well as when I'm counseling with people. Often, a wife too busy criticizing, you don't do this right, you don't put the dishes right, you don't wash right, you don't clean right, you don't sleep right, you don't breathe right, you don't talk right, you don't smile right, you don't hug me right. I mean, the guy is destroyed completely. If you are constantly criticizing your spouse in this way, even if it was a man criticizing a woman, a woman criticizing a man, anybody would be destroyed. And that's one of the reasons why many guys tell me I'm thinking of leaving my wife because I'm not appreciative of what I do. I go out every day, work like a dog, donkey, and come home. And the first thing she barks at me as soon as I walk through the doors is complain, screaming, shouting, where have you been? Why are you late five minutes? Why didn't you buy the shopping? What have you done whole day? Look at me, I'm dead, I'm destroyed. She doesn't even give you time to breathe as soon as he's come home after work. Now, sisters, this is with due respect to you. You're not doing yourself any favor by doing that. If your husband did that to you, I would say the same thing to him. You're not doing yourself any favor. Over criticism destroys a person's self-esteem, their confidence, and their self-worth. And if your husband is feeling that you've destroyed or you're contributing to, this, to the destruction of their self-worth, confidence, then they will not stay within this marriage for long. How, the, how long can a human being take abuse? I don't know whether that is slightly strong for people. What do you think? You're a woman. I'm just reading the comments and I want to welcome some people um, who have just joined us. Um, so let's go back to the top where Hapsa we are. Hafsa is with us. One and second. I, I, this is where we were last, right? 
Okay, it's um, Hafsa was with us, Asif was with us, and he's asking not to give any ideas to his wife. Hafsa says, I, I, I love your honesty. Thank you. Abdul Yusuf, mashallah, says, Asma Paisley, nobody surely goes into a marriage without Yeah, that's what we talked about this okay. before. Marriage is like an empty box. You must put things in if you are taking things out, and if you keep taking, then it wouldn't work. Absolutely. Totally. Umat Baskal said that. Salam, Umayna is salam. with us. Hafsa is again. Um, I think people exp express love and attention in different ways. Frustration can build when you hold on to receiving it only in one particular way, ignoring the ways it's actually coming to us from our spouse. Ansari. Asif, oh my God, don't give Sarah Hayat Ansari any ideas. Sarah, please take ideas and sort this man out. Your husband is a lovely man, alhamdulillah. <laughs> Mashallah. Mashallah. And somebody was asking a question if you are... Just curious, are you... You're a trained counsellor, yes. Um, my husband is a trained counsellor, I'm a trained coach. Um, uh, Subhan, you're welcome to uh, come and join us, inshallah. If you need any help and support, just drop us a line. Info at barefootinstitute.com is the email address. You can always book. And of course, you can always buy the book itself. Yes. Um, on our website, you can find that. We like uh, rec acknowledging people's comments. Rumen Ahmed says, can somebody watch this without logging into Facebook? I sent a link to a friend and required to log. No, you can watch it on um uh, YouTube. Unfortunately, with the YouTube, I think while it is live now, you can watch it live, but it uploads the video after. It takes uh, maybe 24 hours for it to be upload, uploaded and processed because YouTube has to check it. But live, it's going on on YouTube right now. Amster, how can husbands appreciate their wives? Oh, yeah, that's such a nice question. That's a very good point. Very how nice husbands question. can appreciate their wives in many ways. Ask your wife, how would you like to be... How would you like me to appreciate you? Believe you me, she'll give you the answer. Just ask her nicely. Darling, I know you say to me, I don't appreciate you. Please tell me, how would you like me to appreciate you? When I ask you that question and when you tell me, it makes my life easy. I don't have to pull my hair, you know, think about it and worry about it, fret around it and be absolutely in a ball of mess. I don't need to do that. Just ask mm. your partner. The same as man. Ask your husband, how would you like, to be, how would you like me to be appreciated? A man said to me, all I want my wife to do is when I come home is not to complain everything. First thing as soon as I walk through the door. Say salam to me. Greet me well. Ask me how my day was. Help me if I need any help. Mm. If I'm sitting down, offer me a cup of tea if I like a cup of tea. A glass of water would do. Help me to just sat, unwind for a few minutes. I just come from the jungle of the world outside to my own home called Sakina. At Sakina, which is my home, I don't expect a barrage or a storm of complaints, do I? Because all I want her to do is not complain when I get home. Give me a bit of time. Mm. Once I have rested, unwound, and I've eaten, I will give you time. Then we can sit down, sit down and have a chat. But as soon as I walk through the door, if you heard all the complaints at me, I won't want to come home again. Some of you might be wondering that we are talking about things which seem very simple. But I think what we are saying is we are highlighting that it's all about being mindful of what you do some of these things in theory everybody knows these things you yeah. know we read books we listen to talks uh, in practice how mindful are you when you step inside of your home i would expect the same thing when i was out <coughs> if i'm out for the whole day and i know that the kids are at home with my husband i would expect them to allow me some space before i can actually get to the kitchen or do whatever i need to do or just just go and have a shower and, and recuperate from from the outside world how mindful are you of your energy or what you're bringing to the house when you are coming from the outside you are angry tired you had a horrible day how mindful are you that when you step into the house you're bringing that energy with you so of course you will react very quickly if someone doesn't welcome you the way you want it to be welcomed. So it's a two-way process, but again, it's about just thinking about carefully what am I contributing and what am I expecting and how do the two meet? Natasha Iqbal says, thank you for that, Hannah, very beautifully said. Uh, salam to both. Salam, salam, Natasha. Salam. I haven't seen you for a long time. Alyssa Atawil says, um, you marry when you are young. Uh, this is indeed a blessing and you will both grow all together. Both will have the intention to remain together. But during the process, what can happen? Views on religion can change and we should always be learning new things in our faith. But what if these changing views push you apart? You eventually have no choice but to separate and it has been because of seeking a higher relationship 
that is with Allah. That's Ta'ala. a beautiful point. It's a very important, and it's a very important point actually to talk about because people, I think there are a couple of stages where people go through when they get married. They have an expectation of how they want their spouse to be, but not just how to be, but how they want the spouse to be Islamically, what views they should hold, how they should dress, how they should practice, what do they do with the prayers, you know, nitty gritty, but very important things. And if your husband or your wife mm. has fundamentally changed, from your moral and ethical principles that aligned you in the first place. They've moved away, they've shifted. You can no longer have a relationship with them based on those agreed principles with which you began. You are 100% within your right to move on. We're not having any, we don't have, we're not complaining about that. If people have shifted, then you can move, of course. But if you are on the same page, just disagreeing. So for example, my wife and I have two uh, very different approaches to uh, our a certain aspects of religious practices. Though I'm an imam, my wife ex respects me for being an imam, but she has every right to disagree with me if, even if I'm an imam. So for example, when it comes to religion, you have a more sufistic approach to it, mm. to be honest, and I don't. I have a very political approach to Islam. I don't have a problem with her, she doesn't have a problem with me, as long as we don't become cultish about it, as long as we don't become brutal about it, as long as we are not dictatorial about it. So if I insist on my wife not doing anything sophistic and if she insists on me not doing anything political, we'll all just be resentful. So we have a parameter within which we operate. I stood for parliamentary election twice. My wife supported me all the way from campaigning to keeping the house open. My wife wants to do her things within the Sufi ideas and attend circles, or radical circles, she calls it. I don't have a problem. We have parameters within which we operate. So it is absolutely right that if you ideologically as well as philosophically have changed, oops, what's happened here? I think our camera has just caused us a bit of a problem. Let's see um, what's happened here, brothers and sisters. We're going to put this camera on for a second, if you don't mind, Hannah, and we will carry on talking with this camera. But the other camera looks like it's just, just died. Um, you just carry on while I go and sort out that technical problem. Okay, okay. so I'm going to go to the next point, um, which is, both husbands and wives live in constant fear that in such a state of their relationship anyone could come along and sweep them off their feet. Someone else could appear on the horizon and jeopardize their marriage. This fear drives them to the point of insanity. They wish their partner understood their needs and they didn't look elsewhere for appreciation and gratitude. So this is talking about to both sides, for both men and women, where they feel that because of the lack of connection, because of the lack of um, appreciation, the lack of gratitude, um, they are looking elsewhere. And I, I, I have worked with a lot of, lot of women who come to me 10, 15 years of marriage saying, oh, I just met my ideal man. And I know. And, and let's talk about this in our community. It happens in our community. It happens everywhere. It happens with the, you know, mo with the best intention that suddenly you start thinking, I met someone that I have been waiting for all my life. And I'm questioning whether I made the wrong choice by marrying my husband. And I don't know what to do. So they then go into fantasy. And you see, fantasy is a very dangerous thing because, and I want to talk a little bit about the science of this, because when we have fantasize, fantasies and we fantasize about somebody, what we see is, is an unrealistic picture of that person. And when something good happens to us, it's just like a drug, you're going to get a slight hint, hit of dopamine. And when the dopamine hits, you feel really good about yourself and you want more of that. So the dopamine is coming and each time you get a hit of dopamine, you feel so great about what, what's happening to you that you just keep wanting more of that. Now, that's what lust functions on. Love functions on something else. Love functions on oxytocin. And oxytocin is, they call it the cuddle hormone, the love hormone. It's the hormone that is flooding our body when we are giving birth, as women particularly, and both the child and the mother will get a hit of that oxytocin. So what ends up happening in that uh, particular scenario is that at the, as the baby is born, the oxytocin is released um, in the body and it connects and it bonds people. This is also one of the reasons why they call it the bond hormone, the bonding hormone, is that the minute um, that happens, you actually start working on sustaining a loving relationship. You are no longer running on a fantasy. And, and I'm saying this to people who have got marriages where one or the other partner is act uh, could be addicted to um, indecent images, 
There you go. There's a new You're camera. camera. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> Slightly new one. Our old one has just died. Oh, great. I'm really sorry, ladies and gentlemen. We are. We apologize. So there, bear with us while we do deal with this one. This one looks good, right? It looks fine. Um, so my, my attention was all over the place. I'm so sorry. That's I'm so okay, sorry. But that's you did okay. very well considering what I was doing. I'm just going to adjust that camera for a second. This is the problem with self-production, uh, brothers and sisters. <laughs> you have to do everything by yourself. But carry on. So sorry. Um, so we were talking about bonding. Um, so love and relationship, uh, any relationship, but particularly marriage, we have to focus on the bonding hormone, the oxytocin, and that is what the work is. That's what we need to uh, pay attention to. What we need to reduce is the dopamine hit we get by getting attention from people. I was, kind of, um, I was working with somebody a couple of years ago who was married for about 10, 12 years and she had children. And she got infatuated with a man who was giving her a lot of attention and she suddenly felt alive and everything was amazing. Um, she kept the marriage, she kept going, but her fantasies were going wilder and wilder. And each time um, the man gave her attention, she just imagined it further and further down the line. But the man was married. Um, they didn't have any future together, um, but they both knew it. Um, so I, I think it's a very dangerous ground uh, to be on if you don't pay attention to to what sustains a marriage because then and I think it happens in a lot of marriages people leave really quickly thinking there is someone else better yeah. but then that someone else better is never better it's just different and you will have a different challenge so if you think grass is greener somewhere else I've got mm. terribly bad news for you never will you find grass greener anywhere else in the world grass is only as green as you make it so if I want to invest in my marriage Allah says that in the Quran so beautifully your spouse is like a um, piece of land that you own, very precious piece of land that you own. It's an, it's, a, it's, a, it's an analogy, so don't take it literally. Your wife is not your uh, land or your husband is not your land. It is an analogy. What does a farmer do to his land or her land? They cultivate it. They invest in it by putting a, a fertile soil inside, by uh, adding fertilizer, natural ones, by taking away weeds by making sure the crops are uh, planted at the right time, watered, loved, cared for. If infections take over, they come and deal with it. If animals or insects were to start eating the crops, they will deal with it. And at the end of it, depends on how much work a farmer has invested in the um, land itself, the yield would be accordingly. And my brothers and sisters, a relationship is like that. If you think gr grass is somewhere else, greener, greener somewhere else, you ignore your own relationship, both of you will leave because that's what happens. Let's go to number four. Mm -hmm. While we do, let's I'm, also I'm acknowledge a few more. Just go through them because people do like that. Thank oh. you. So, Alison, a Tawi, excellent answer. Thank you, Shama. That's better. Thank you for giving us the feedback on the camera. My wife is constantly moody, says Amsta. She doesn't control her tongue or anger. She always says she wants a divorce. I have raised it with a family with little progress, 15 years. Is there any hope? So, first of all, I don't think this is a conversation that you should be having with your family, number one, because I think families with all the best intention, you, your family, everybody has vested interest, whether you stay or not. And, you know, I, I, I think it's one of those very sensible things that you take it to a third party. You allow yourself to give the space to talk about it from an objective point of view. Everyone in your family will have an emotional response, whether they want you to stay or they want you to leave. So it's very important. It's not a conversation for families. It's not a conversation for friends because you can talk about it over and over again. What you do, you're reinforcing the old stories that she is holding against you and you are holding against her. So it has to be objective. I'll give you a good example, a good story. A man came home and his wife said, I want a divorce right now. He said, are you sure? She said, yeah, right now. So he said, if you're sure, I will give it to you. She said, yes, I want it. I've been thinking about it. I need it right now. He said, okay. He went into his study room. He stayed there for five, ten minutes, came up and gave her an envelope saying, you wanted a divorce? Here it is. He had a bag on his hand. He said, I'm going. Don't call me. Don't contact me. I will contact you when I'm ready. Salam. And he left. So the wife held the envelope on her hand and she sat in there on the chair looking at the envelope, not knowing what to do. Should I open it? Should I not open it? What should I do? So she waited and waited. Until the afternoon went into the evening. When the evening came, the daughters that she, they had daughters, they came home from school or wherever they were. 
they sat with their mother and said, Mom, what's the matter? Why are you sitting in the dark holding an envelope and have you, you're not moving? She said, well, this is what happened. I told your dad to give me a divorce. He's given me a divorce and left. So they all cried together for a long time, of course, realizing that this is the end of a powerful marriage that they had, blah, blah, blah. The kids cried more. Mother cried too. Anyway, two, three days later, miserable at home, everyone not talking to each other. The daughter sat together and said to mom, mom, um, have you looked at the envelope? Have you opened up the envelope? He may have left some instructions as to what to do. We are all stuck. We don't know what to do. She goes, no, I haven't opened it. So the daughter says, mom, open it. So she opens the envelope. The open envelope, she, as she opens, takes a piece of paper out. The piece of paper is blank. So there's nothing written on it. Mm. She looks at the paper and she looks at the daughters. The daughters look at mom. Mom, daddy hasn't written anything on it. Mm. Mom goes, call him. So the girl calls the father. The father answers the phone yet. Dad, uh, please come home. No, I don't want to come home. Please come home. Say, no, we, I don't want to come home. But dad, you've left mommy a divorce paper with nothing written on it. He said, that's exactly why I left. And I'm not coming home until your mom makes a promise that she will never ask for a divorce ever again. And if she asks for it, if she better mean it. Divorce is not a joke. They spoke. They agreed. He came home. They made a contract that no matter what happens, neither he nor her will ever demand for a divorce. And when they do, they will mean it. This is an advice to brothers and sisters. Mm. Many brothers use the Allah-given right to say to your wife, I give you a divorce, I give you a talaq. Three of them, they give in one go, in some cases hundreds, because they're angry. Brothers and sisters, not only are you an abusive person with your right Allah has given you, you are absolutely destroying the other person. And sisters, if you're demanding divorce all the time from your husband, just out of the smallest of the arguments that you have, there is something else going on in your mind, in your head, that needs to be looked at, examined. You cannot be using, remember, don't weaponize divorce. Weaponizing divorce is a crime in a relationship. Never use a divorce word unless you mean it. If you mean it, you better live up to it. I, we will talk about divorce in another program, but please do not use divorce as a weapon for controlling the other person. Let's go to the next one. Are there any questions that we need to answer? Um, because lots of points have come through and I know you don't... Um, I s this Okay, very good. Jana says, I think... Um, so, so perhaps having a high expectation from one another. I agree with sister being mindful as we exist or enter our home, acknowledge respectfully, understand each other's days and it has been full of hectic, you know, hectic because the home is a safe zone. It never should be a harsh zone. And Hafsa is asking, I think, a very important question. Would you say one of the underlying issues nowadays is that people are more vulnerable to the instant hits and feeling good and getting attention outside of the marriage rather than investing time and attention to work in their struggling marriage, which is much longer road towards those feeling good. Feel. Absolutely. I think we live in a world where you click and you buy something within a number of milliseconds you can buy you can purchase happiness you can buy things on amazon you go on instagram you see people's happy lives and i think we have lost the art of understanding of what is meaningful to us and i think it's very easy for people to look for perfection to go i think this has fallen down that's why probably people can't hear oh um so if you lift, it up, you and lift it up because asif has just said your volume is quite low not wanting to belittle Asif, but I don't know if Asif's hearing has gone with his age or if it's our microphone. So can I ask other people to confirm if you can really hear us? Um, really sorry to have disturbed you, but that message popped up to say... I hope it's better. Um, so just show, so us, show it to us. So yes, I, I think it's much easier to go for instant gratification than to actually sit down and work out what the difficulty is. Because we have seen this with so many people. They leave the marriage and they struggle with the same or even worse problems and they go to the next relationship. Of course. The baggage is with us. That's what I'm trying to say. So running away from the baggage is not going to solve any relationship pro problem. The gin, somebody said to me, the gin is inside you, not in your wife or your husband. Yes. If you go yes. from one relationship to the next one, the gin is going with you. When I say gin, I mean the, the baggage, as Hannah says. It's a good way of putting it for Muslims. Okay, let's go to question number four. Uh, uh, five. Point number five. <laughs> this is for men. <laughs> Women like you to be alive in the relationship. She wants to feel your pulses. She wants you to talk about what matters to her um, and to feel you hearing her, not nodding politely, not placating, definitely not playing devil's advocate. Women like a man who can play or can pay full attention when she is talking to him. She does not want to uh, play with your 
phone. She doesn't want you to play with your phone or type away on your laptop, browse the net uh, on your smart gadget, pretending that you're listening. In other words, in your relationship, a man and a woman, by the way, but more so for a woman, she would like you to be present in that relationship. We've mentioned it before. Why don't we say present? I mean physically present, emotionally present, intellectually present, intimately present, and most importantly for a Muslim, spiritually present, right? All of those presents in a relationship make your relationship so much powerful that you cannot even imagine. So if your wife is feeling that you're in the room, but your mind is somewhere else, she's talking to you, but you're busy with your phone. She wants to address an issue, but you're typing away your latest essay or chatting to a friend on whatever. If your wife knows that you're not paying any attention to what she is asking for, she will be upset. She will be resentful. She will be angry. And if it continues for a long time, she will feel that she's less important and she's not being given value and worth what she believes she is, and she will leave you. But one of the best examples of the Prophet ﷺ himself is that there are stories and narrations which explain that when he was talking to somebody, he was so present, because when you're present, you can be responsive. You can, you know, he, he turned with his whole body, he, and everybody felt individually that he was talking to him, so the message was going directly. So, so you know... Yeah. In Shammai al-Tirmidhi, Rasulullah's description is, he wasn't anyone extraordinary in his... Uh, presence in a mitzvah. So he would not sit on a high chair. Mm. He would not make himself aggrandize a bit more. He would not wear extraordinary cloaks or a turban just to be different. No. And yet we felt his presence amidst us as the most important and the most powerful person listening to all of our conversations. In a relationship is difficult, I understand, because in the modern time, even in the ancient time with our children, with so many things going on, it may not be possible. It's okay for you to say to your wife, right now, darling, I'm very busy. Can I give you some time, quality time later on? Right now, I need to do X, Y, and Z. And if you're okay, while I'm talking to other people on the phone, while I'm typing on the laptop, if it's okay for you to keep talking, I don't mind. But if it's going to be a problem, let's delay the conversation for later. A sane person, whether a husband or a wife, will understand that. But if it's every time you're pushing it away, then they won't understand it. Let's go to some of these points. Asif, I don't. I think Asif. Yeah, I think I think it's co it's confirmed that the volume was fine. Um, Asif's hearing was low. So, <laughs> so uh, Sarah, if you're listening, please sort his hearing mm. out. Don't shout in his ears. Poor soul, he's very soft-hearted. Um, maybe get the ca cat to meow next to him <laughs> so he can hear it. Inshallah, that's a good friend of ours, by the way, Asif. Um, and may Allah bless him and his family. Shama says, I can hear you. Yeah, volume is great. <laughs> so Excellent. Says, Thank you for the feedback. So <laughs> let's go to the next point. This is for the women. Men like you to demonstrate your gratitude. He wants to experience your appreciation. He wants to hear that you value hard work that he puts into earning a living for you and the children. He wants to know that he has been providing for you adequately and you are happy that he does provide. He does not want to be drowned under your list of complaints the moment he walks through the door. He does not want you to be his brutal critique and certainly not his dismissive mother. <laughs> so, um, I... You know, I think there's a wisdom why gratitude has been more highlighted um, for for the female species. Um, and I, I, I was writing about this this morning, actually, that uh, my reflection was that gratitude is one of the hardest thing to practice. Patience and gratitude. Uh, for me, patience is an added element to it. But, <laughs> but gratitude is actually an art, and I, we lost it. Um, and I, I, and I, I really feel that can yeah. I be honest here? Mm. Can I be honest? Sure. I have no problem saying thank you to you all the time. Mm. But you do in return to me. No, I don't have a problem saying thank you. I have a problem saying sorry. No, I also see. I also feel it. I'm telling you from my end, so don't dismiss my feelings here. Mm. Uh, sorry is one thing for sure. That's another discussion. But I think saying thank you as readily as I say to you in our relationship, mm. I'm, I'm afraid it's not. But I understand this. I'm not, I'm not complaining. I'm sharing it with public so that they understand. Mm. That part of our human nature is that we should recognize mm. that we as human, as man and woman, struggle with different things, right? If your wife is struggling with one thing, it's fine. As long as she has got the uh, <laughs> ingrained qualities that she like, and I do with my wife, I have no issues, alhamdulillah. So even if she doesn't say thank you enough, even if she doesn't appreciate what I do, it's fine with me. I can live with it. But for some people, it's not enough. But I also want you to know, and I want to share this in the, the reason why I don't say thank you is because I've never seen it done. Oh, okay. 
I've never, never seen it. I've never seen it done, but I've gone the other way, mm -hmm. thinking I will do extraordinary amounts so that I don't do, fall into the same. Yeah. You know, in Bengali culture, in Bengali cities, especially where we come from, the word thank you doesn't even appear in the vocabulary. The dictionary, yeah. In the local vocabulary I'm talking about. In proper Bengali, there is, of course, but very few people use this. Mm. Their idea of gratitude is, I'm here. Oh, have, I'm you, have you eaten? Oh, that, that's how are you, basically. <laughs> yeah. You're fine. Have you eaten? Uh, so these are, of mm. course, cultural quirks. So it's very strange. You have never seen it. Proper. I have never seen it done in my household. My mother probably never, ever. I have never heard my mother saying thank you to my dad. Well, that's uh, that's news to me. I didn't know that. No, but I, that's why I'm sharing it with you and with those of you who have struggled with this. Sorry and thank you was not done in my household. <laughs> I can understand your mom saying no, uh, never saying sorry. But I always hear her saying thank you to us. To us, yes. But he, she never said it to my to my dad. Wow. And I think that's... For me, that was, it's a blind spot, and we all have blind spots. We need to realize that. So if you're suffering from a problem called ingratitude, uh, uh, like Hannah said, identify where it comes from. Where does it come from? Have you not learned it? Have you not seen your mother or your father do it? Because if you haven't seen them do enough, the danger is if we don't do enough, our children will learn that, yes. and that will become their blind spot. So we have to be conscious of it, right? So ingratitude is one of the reasons why men live mm. from a relationship. But I also think women live too if you are in great, uh, in great. And Allah says that in the Quran. Allah does not like those who are in great. I'm ungrateful. You ungrateful. Mean. Yeah. I think probably one of, one of the many reasons why Allah put us together is that there are some lessons that I can only learn through you and with you. I can't learn it with anybody else. And so. you can also teach me a huge amount. So anyway, let's go to number seven. Thank you for that. Oh, by the way, let's see if there is any. I find the volume quite low every week and with <laughs> any background noise I can't hear you at all. I'm so sorry, sister. Maybe you should invest in a small speaker and that will increase the volume. But we, we believe we have improved it. Inshallah, we'll sort it out again. Agree. I don't know if it is lost um, Art of understanding, understanding or, or reluctance. reluctance. You can read it because I can't see. Or a reluctance to understand or a person hasn't had the opportunity to understand that things take time or work. Yeah, Again, absolutely. it's about Good. being conscious. Shireen, but what happens if you have years of trauma behind you caused by your husband and it affects your current mental health? OK, here's one of the issues that we need to look at. Some, sometimes people think the problem is the relationship. Sometimes the problem is us. Sometimes the problem is to do with what has been caused and sometimes you have to do it yourself. So there is individual issue and you have to be able to separate whether individually you need to deal with the trauma first and then you can make a decision whether you want to stay in that marriage or not. Or if your husband is willing and ready and open, then you have to do the trauma work together. And this is something that uh, we believe that if you do it together, it develops intimacy. It helps you see the other person's perspective. It opens your eyes. It helps you to see a bigger picture because maybe the trauma that has been troubling you as a relationship issue, it's coming from a place that neither your husband knows and you don't know it either. And yeah. we have experience with that because when we don't understand our own pattern, we do things to other people that becomes normal for us but we don't realize the impact yeah, and for yeah. people who have been causing trauma they have to see the impact of their behavior this um, as soon as our sister a sister actually wrote to me recently she said i have been married to my husband for now 20 years mm. we have had trauma from our previous relationship we were married before but we've never discussed it mm. but the first time i was able to discuss it is by reading the introduction of this book with my husband we read it and because you mentioned about your past marriage we were the f you, you inspired us to com have a conversation. So brothers and sisters, there are many ways to have a conversation. One is to talk to yourself, if you can. The other is to talk to, uh, I'll, I'll help you with that, don't worry. Um, uh, get Buy the book and help the book facilitate you having a conversation. What I mean by this is with your spouse, read the book together, chapter by chapter, do exercise together, reflections together, and have a conversation. That would be one way. Or the third way, is actually to find a marriage counsellor. Again, you can find a marriage counsellor, a relationship counsellor or a coach nearby, wherever you are, or you can come to us. We can provide all of that. But ultimately, if there are past traumas in your relationship mm. that you are carrying, or from the relationship or outside relationship, please don't live, uh, uh, don't live in, in silence suffering from it. Just find a way forward, inshallah. And also don't forget that if you're experiencing trauma from your husband, have you thought about your relationship with your own father? Mm. Have you thought about what you learned about relationships? Are you just projecting some or all of the trauma onto your husband because you individually haven't actually understood what happened to your, um, to, what did you learn about relationship as you were growing up? 
So, so quite, it's a co co quite a, a, a layered response. I appreciate that. But it's a lot to think about. Sobia says, um, gadgets ha are taking over our lives. Everyone is guilty of it, not paying enough attention properly. Natasha says, gratitude is a key for both parties. Otherwise, resentment sets in. Very true. Asif, oh my God, you are guys having a domestic. Yeah, we, Asif, we have domestic. We need you here to sort out our <laughs> domestic. Would you come over, please? With, we uh, have some domestic, some from time to time. Uh, would you like to order some uh, uh, mitai from him? Uh, Make sure you bring some Ambala sweets on your way, Asif. Shama Rahman says, I miss your lovely mom, ha Hen. Uh, we, I do too as well. She's unfortunately stuck somewhere uh, in Ireland. Oh, she, she mom is stuck in Ireland at the moment with my brother. With Raihan corona, says, Salam. Sobia says, the volume is fine, Alhamdulillah. Jana says, sorry and thank you. Those two words are very powerful. Makes a huge difference. Saying thank you to each other is something Allah loves, appreciate one another and of course Allah as well what number are we on we are on number seven number I think. seven she wants you to feel her she doesn't want your mm, fumbling or absent-minded groping or even um, all the uh, quick uh, intimate encounters that you have just to release your frustration she wants you to she wants to feel your passion she wants to know that you find her attractive despite the changes in all things that she has gone through she wants you she wants to know that you think about her even when other people are around in your life. She wants you to be alive in her presence and alive in her absence with thoughts of her. I think this is very beautiful, actually. A, a husband and a wife would like to know that you're not thinking about anybody else except them, especially intimately. Mm. And when a woman feels that her husband um, is secure with her and she feels secure with him, the, I think the, the relationship will blossom. One of the greatest, most devastating impact of infidelity um, is, of course, that two people's lives, two families' lives, children, in-laws, and many other, gets completely destroyed. So uh, that's why keeping your focus on your spouse on intimate level is so essential. And if that's missing, one of the reasons why either of the parties would leave. And I know relationships where this is absent, sadly. If intimacy is absent in your relationship, please evaluate your relationship again. Try and reignite some sort of intimacy. You can't survive otherwise, whether you're a man or a woman. So we keep asking the question, and I know you will keep thinking about, should I stay or should I go? What's the reason? And 10 I think minutes to go. I know, but this number 0.9, I think it's a really important go one. And it. I think that's, that's going to sum up a lot of things. So your wife may want to leave you because she no longer feels your passion. But the question is, can you feel your own passion? <laughs> Go ahead and show it to her. Not just your own passion for her, but for your passion for being alive. Do you have it? It's the most attractive thing you possess. If you have lost it, why have you lost it? Where has it gone? If you never discovered it, are you living on borrowed time? One of the things that people often say that, you know, we're just running on a usual, empty, empty it's boring, it's, there's nothing exciting. And we are expecting someone, the spouse, to make it exciting for us. But we don't realize that we have run out of, completely run out of, you know, fuel to run our own life. We are not passionate about anything. If you are, are boring, not, if you are boring yourself, mm. and if I was boring myself. Oh, what a marriage. I how could we have created an exciting marriage ourselves? Exactly. It doesn't work, does it? Both people have to find some passion. <clears throat> and I say to pe people, if you have lost spark of life, if you have lost passion in your life, in your marriage, go and do something about it. You know, somebody I recommended to go for a long walk. And you know what he did? Hmm. He took a long hike to Kilimanjaro. Excellent. He and trained. he revived himself, yeah, I assume. He trained. He went all the way, flew into the uh, uh, country, and then went for a long trek. I think it takes about a week of trekking and uh, mm. and sleeping rough out in the uh, open in tents, and he did an amazing job. He came back fully, fully revived, high spirited. So, if you have lost your mojo, <laughs> as they say, please do something about it. Don't blame your wife or your husband, saying, "Oh my God, she's boring. He's boring." If you can't feel your own passion, if you're not passionate yourself, if you don't have a reason to live. You can't make somebody else feel excited about you. You can't force it out on somebody else to give you passion. You you have to, again, it's about what you bring to the house. If you're boring yourself, if you have given up, if you really have no, nowhere to go, nothing to do, which is why we always recommend to couples, have your own life, have your own passions, your hobbies, the things that you do 
for yourself, with your friends, on your own, whatever it takes to get you back to some sort of pro positive vibration. And, and sometimes you can't force your spouse to join your hobby. Actually, you should never do. If they want to do, a, if you have a joint hobby, well and good. If you don't, that's fine. For example, my wife likes walking. I don't like walking. I love cycling. My wife isn't too keen on cycling, even if it's a summer or winter. I go out for cycling even in the winter. For example, yesterday I went for a cycle ride the day before. Two hours, I cycled in this freezing we weather, but it was just amazing. It clears my head. It enables me to just get on with my life for a little while. I was going to a place and I come back from a place. I get to see so many things, new things around. I don't need to talk to anyone. I'm on my bike. I'm speeding in a particular mm -hmm. direction. I'm not getting in touch with anybody. There is no COVID uh, contact, in other words. I believe you can do lots of things. I'm very good with my woodwork, for example. So I have a hobby. I sometimes make my own furniture at home. Um, I, do, I love gardening. I do and go and do my own gardening when I need to. You've got your own hobbies. You like walking. You like reading. You like writing. All sorts of things that we like. Just find them. Even if it is like our friend Sharma who loves cooking. Mm. Or like Asif playing with his cat. Mm. Because it's something that you need to bring life back to yourself. It, don't, don't blame your husband for it or, or your wife for it. Oh, it's because it's boring. I need to leave and find someone who's a bit more exciting. If you're boring yourself, another exciting person is going to leave you because you will become the one who becomes boring. Absolutely. To him or her. So just think about it that way. Ibrahim Ibn Amiya says, um, new generation sees marriage as toxic. Many of them can't uh, man up take up a res responsibility as man and provide for their family, still live in their parents' houses with their wife. Uh, this should be uh, should not be happening in 21st centuries. So Ibrahim Ibn Amir, I agree with many of the, what you've said, that many people have not been able to cut their umbilical cord from their, husband, from their mm. parents and they live in their shadow of their parents. We all need to wake up and we all need to cut our umbilical cord and become adults. As adults, we need to make our own decisions, make our own path, make our own ways, especially when we're married. And I say to brothers and sisters, if you are in a married, marital relationship, carve out your roles and responsibilities and deliver on them. If you don't deliver on them, nobody will have respect for you. Um, uh, Shama says... Uh, can't wait to treat you both. We can't wait to come and have your food. We haven't had it for a long except time. Except as long as it doesn't have any garam masala. Remember that. Yes. <laughs> My, I don't do garam masalas, by the way. So I think we probably need to start wrapping up. We've got about five minutes before we finish. So, um, Hafsa's comment. Do you want to read that first before you go yes. anywhere else? So I think young people have much less tolerance for problems in a marriage and choose very quickly to walk instead of facing head on. I believe some of the biggest culprits of this breakdown today is because we are living in an age of extreme digital distraction, instant gratification um, and loss of manners. How can we start to address it in our community? I think we should do a separate Education. live on this one because we need to start educating ourselves and what are the things that they are taking away from being mindful and learn about the roles and what it means, what, what our role is within the community uh, and in a marriage. That comment uh, sparred in my thought. We should do a program called M uh, Morals and Manners in a Marriage. Yeah. Simply on morals and manners in a marriage. Brothers and sisters, is so important. Okay, brothers and sisters, we need to finish off. We finish at 11, as you know. Three, four minutes to go before we come to an end, or maybe even a couple of minutes. Are there any questions from anybody that we need to answer? We're willing to answer it. But before we go, let's get back to our book. As you know, we've been promoting this book ever since it came out onto the market called Step, 10 Steps to Getting Married and Staying Married. Please do order it. Order it online by going to barefootinstitute.com forward slash bookstore. You can buy my book, my wife's great book called Heart Smart. It's a fantastic book. It's a woman's journey from her head to her heart. Not what I said last week, which was head to her toe, head to her heart. Yes. And if any of you wanting to know why I said at the very beginning of the program that I thought about leaving this marriage, it's all in the book. So you can find out um, and you can do your own reflection. Please don't leave your marriage. Don't run away because when you run away, you take your baggage with you. It doesn't get resolved by simply running away. What it does, it t takes it away or it buries it and then it explodes explodes so brothers and sisters i'd like you to really reconsider your marriage buy the book both of our books if you want read them read them with your partner i will guarantee you it will stimulate a huge amount of introspection reflection conversations honest conversations to be uh, precise and most importantly it will heal your relationship inshallah so please do join us is it every sunday Yes, we will be here next Sunday at 10 o'clock with coffee and oh, I need to bring my coffee next time. Um, we'll be continuing the conversation, following the book and please do send us some questions. Come and see our new website. There are some great resources, some interesting ideas. 
on the website, send us questions, reflections, and give us any other topics that you want us to talk about. We will be very happy to entertain. But for now, we are going to say goodbye Natasha Iqbal says, great conversation as always. Salam to you both. Uh, Shama says, sometimes there is no choice but to leave. Yes. Jana holds this very important topic. Thank you so much for sharing. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. Take care.